Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar, the Agora Institute Symposium 2020. Uh, this is a primer on submitting your proposal to present. Uh, we're glad that you joined us this afternoon. My name is Bruce Friend. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Agora Institute. And I'm joined today by Christy Ellis, our events project manager. And the purpose of our webinar today is to walk you through uh, some of the details about our call for presentation proposals, uh, maybe give you some insights and in some of the timelines and things that we're looking for within uh, presentation proposals um, as we'll be, re we'll be reviewing them later this spring. Um, and I also want to welcome those who may be watching this from our archived version as well. Uh, we will be recording this uh, for future viewing for those who aren't able to join us in person today. So with that, why don't we just go ahead and get started. Uh, we're super excited about uh, our symposium this year in, in San Antonio. Uh, and before I jump into there, there's a few housekeeping things I should say. One is don't be, don't be afraid to introduce yourself in the chat box. Um, we are going to open it up for questions at the end of our presentation. Christy and I will try to be brief. Uh, though we do have a lot of information we want to cover. Um, but if you have questions um, throughout, feel free to add them into the chat box. Uh, we'll also open up for open that up for um, questions and answers at the end as well. And you can see the link there to our to our website, our brand new website actually that just launched last week. And you can find a lot of additional information about the symposium uh, on our website. So I encourage you to visit there as well. So our symposium this year is held in, being held in San Antonio. We're, we're thrilled to be going back there. We were there a few years ago, for those of that may have been with us previously. Uh, the dates are October 25th and the 28th, through the 28th. And the theme of this year's symposium is a new dawn for every learner. Um, so we're certainly in interesting times right now, uh, all across the country, really all across the globe with the coronavirus. And did want to say from the outset that obviously we are keeping very close watch on what's happening um, across the country, uh, specific to San Antonio and Texas. Um, at this time, we are still very much on track to hold our symposium live in October. Uh, we're seeing that most of the events that are being canceled around the country right now tend to be in the April and May time frame. We obviously know this is a very fluid situation and things are changing, it seems, daily. Um, the best place for you to keep informed of, any, of, of anything related to the symposium or any kind of changes that may be necessary uh, would be obviously to keep following us on the website and following us on social media as well. But at this time, we are expecting to hold the symposium in San Antonio. Therefore, we're going to go forward with our, our call for uh, presentation proposals as well. Again, if something along those lines would change, we would certainly keep everyone well informed of that. Um, you'll even see that uh, in this year's RFP questions, we added a question about whether or not, if it came to it, would you be willing to do your presentation in a virtual format and you simply answer yes or no um, when you fill out that part of the uh, call for proposals. But um, we're going to think positively and uh, uh, plan to, to host in San Antonio as, as planned. Here's a quick look at our RFP timeline uh, for this year. Uh, the RFP did open earlier this week. It opened on Monday. Um, we actually are extending the window of time this year. And the truth be told, it's because of the coronavirus. And you know that a lot of folks that ordinarily would submit proposals might otherwise have their attention elsewhere, and rightfully so right now with schools being closed down all across the, uh, all across the country. Um, so that window of opportunity for submitting a proposal is through May 1st, uh, and it is a deadline. It, it will cut off at 11.59 uh, 59, uh, on May 1st Eastern time. So you'll want to make sure you get your proposal uh, in before that, uh, that time. Uh, it will be mid-June um, before acceptances, wait lists, and decline notifications get out. That's a little bit delayed for uh, um, further along the calendar than in years past, but again, because we're going to extend the timeline for the RFP, it'll take us a little bit more time to 
to process all the submissions that we get and, and build out the program. So by mid-June, um, our pledge is to have all proposals um, identified as to which ones we would we want to accept and which ones might be waitlisted. Um, also, throughout the months of June and July, if your proposal is accepted, you'll have the opportunity, opportunity to go back into the online system and make any updates that might be necessary. Um, but the deadline for that will be August 3rd, as this timeline shares as well, because there is a point where we have to have the, the final program complete and everything ready for our mobile application and, and program book. And um, so by August 3rd, we need to have any of those, any of those changes. So each year we do have session strands, if you're familiar with, with our symposium. Uh, what we try to do is um, have the sessions fall into one or more major category or strand, as we call them, uh, that are critical to the field of personalized and competency-based uh, education. Um, we really carefully curate each strand um, and to make sure that we have really outstanding sessions within each. Um, now, when you're at the symposium, uh, you're welcome to go to sessions in any strand that you want, or you can certainly focus in a certain strand of sessions if you want. Or if you're there with the team, sometimes they'll kind of conquer, divide and conquer, and you know, go to sessions across multiple strands. Now, this year we actually are, we, we purposefully um, scaled back the number of strands that we have. In, in the past, we've had as many as 25 different strands. Um, and we're really narrowing it down to seven this year, along with uh, if, if you feel that your proposal may not quite fit the strands you see there listed one through seven, and you know, you know, if you look at an other category, you can certainly choose other as well. But uh, please understand, we're still very much looking for proposals that cover topics from uh, you know, communications, online or blended learning, assessments, leadership, um, uh, career technical education, quality, um, but we feel, we, we do feel, and we've taken a hard look at this, that a lot of those very specific topics that you might want to submit proposals on can fall in under one of these, one of these strands. So rather than having a real big list of 25 or so, we're, we're scaling this back, but still certainly looking for, for presentation proposals that might be on a specific topic around personalized or competency-based ed um, learning opportunities for, for students. We also have very different types of session formats as well. So when you're completing the RFP, after you tell us what strand you think that your session is, or proposal is um, uh, a best fit for, you'll also pick um, what type of session format that you're uh, proposing your session B. And I'm going to run through what those formats will be here shortly. Um, suffice, it, suffice it to say, you're going to hear this from me and you'll probably hear, hear it uh, <laughs> really throughout the summer if your proposal is accepted, that we really do desire sessions that incorporate personalized learning and competency-based approaches. Um, we want to try to, as best we can to that the sessions model the very types of learning experiences that we were advocating for our students as well. Um, year after year, the feedback that we get uh, when we do the post symposium evaluation, one of the things that always stands out from our attendees is that they really appreciate sessions. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's a one-hour session or a two-hour workshop. They, they really do appreciate sessions that get them engaged, uh, not, like, not just with the speakers, but also maybe with the other people in the, in the room that, that day. Um, and so really, the, do think very purposefully about how you want to engage your attendees uh, and what type of learning experiences you're going to provide them, maybe even assess what they, give them an opportunity to assess or share what they've learned as well. Uh, so do be thinking thoughtfully about um, moving away from just sort of the stand and deliver type of, type of format, regardless of the session format that you choose. So if I may, let me give you a, a quick snapshot. Uh, and again, you can always revisit, revisit this uh, in the RFP itself. But we do have workshop sessions. We have design workshops and hands-on workshops. Both of those are two-hour and 15-minute uh, interactive opportunities. Purposely designed to be a little bit longer, so a little bit more time to engage with and interact with the attendees. 
Um, workshops are offered. Um, they'll be offered on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of the symposium. As a matter of fact, on the last day of the symposium, which is the 28th of October, it's, it's only a half day, and we only do workshops on, 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 those, on those days. And uh, these are always some of the more popular sessions that we have. I think our attendees really do appreciate the opportunity to dig in a little bit deeper on topics uh, in this workshop format. Um, as you're thinking about your own proposal, too, keep in mind that we often see these workshop formats. It's not uncommon for teams from a certain school or a certain district to actually come together. And so they really are looking for an opportunity to dig deeper um, and kind of really roll up their sleeves and, 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 and share and interact uh, in, these, in these longer workshop type of sessions. Two other types of sessions that we have, and these are one-hour sessions, is knowledge sharing um, and a seminar type of session as well. Um, knowledge, again, knowledge sharing or one hour, uh, really meant for deep discussion among participants, usually spending them more than five minutes to, at the start to kick off the session and then really setting the stage for a lot of interaction and discussion uh, around specific uh, roles or topics. Um, seminar, similar uh, in, in its format. Um, with the seminars, we do ask if if possible, that if you have any kind of preview materials that you want to share in advance, you'll be able to do that through our mobile application. Uh, that way people will hopefully have come prepared to and preview any of the materials that you might be covering in that type of um, format. Two others are debate and, debate and panel or interactive discussion. Um, debate and panels are always fun. Again, uh, we usually get pretty good um, comments back from folks who participated in these. Uh, we want them to be lively. We want, we want, we want, we encourage panelists, if you're on a topic, you know, it, it, that uh, there's differentiation, differentiation of opinion, excuse me, uh, on a topic, you have, have people that, you know, have, bring different insights and bring different experiences to the table. Um, those are always fun and, you know, kind of the pass the mic and let, let the attendees get engaged, to, in, get engaged in this as well. Um, interactive discussions, again, three, usually three to four expert presenters, um, not necessarily obvious talking at one time, but, but sort of the, you know, almost like a TED talk like a setup where you might have each, each share a little bit about what they're working on and what challenges they're facing and what they've accomplished. And we typically put these in larger rooms, round tables, again, to kind of, you might even think of having an expert at each table um, on, a, on a different topic is, is one format that a lot of people like to use for the inter interactive discussion. So here's our mission and our vision. Um, the mission of our organization is to drive the transformation of educational systems and accelerate the advancement of breakthrough policies and practices to ensure high quality learning for all. One of the things that we are doing new this year in the RFP is you'll see our six values there. And we try to live by those values in all the work that we do, uh, both internally uh, as well as external facing work that we do. Um, when you go into the RFP, each of these values will have a, a hot link where you can read it. It's just a sentence or two uh, about our value, for example, our, our value around being future focused or equity driven. Um, we will be asking you this, this, this year for the first time to, and it won't, it's not a long essay, trust me. It's, I think it's, um, just a few hundred characters. <laughs> but we will be asking you to identify one or two of these values that you think mirrors what you would be presenting about. Um, how does this value impact or otherwise is aligned with, uh, what it is you're, you're you're proposing to present on. And so we would very much like to hear from you as to how your work might also align to these values. And so part of the, part of the RFP process will be a short question about, about just that. Uh, how does your proposal align to um, one or two of the, uh, of the values? You, you, don't, you do not have to make a statement about all six and choosing just one or two is, is, is more than adequate. Um, and again, you'll see that question in the RFP. So in terms of some tips for completing the RFP, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Christy Ellis, and uh, 
Chris, if you'd be so kind and you walk our attendees through uh, some tips that we have for how to congest complete the Thank office. you, Bruce. I'd be happy to. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christy Ellis, and it's a joy to be with you guys today, and I appreciate you joining our call. We do have some tips. Um, some of you may have submitted in the past, and uh, we do need to create a new profile and adventure. So it's start, it is starting over, but it's, it's, some things may have changed, so that's a great way for us to capture that. But a new pro, when you create your new profile, that will you'll create your login and your password so you can enter the system. We ask for one point of contact, which is preferably the lead presenter, as it says, that would share all the information with the co-presenters. And it also verifies conflicts. Once we build the program, you know, we be, that's helpful in making sure that we can make changes accordingly if there is a conflict. Uh, each co-presenter will uh, receive the correspondence, but we do ask that the lead presenter kind of make sure and ensure that they, you know, do receive the information. We, when creating your profile, it's very helpful if you could use the same email. And everyone needs to have a unique email, so we can't use the same one for everyone. Uh, every presenter and co-presenter within the, our, the proposal needs to have their own unique email, which will serve, helps with a couple of things. And we ask that one of them being with registration, because down the road we'll have a lot of different communications, and we want to ensure that uh, you receive them, as well as uh, being able to access the mobile app. So, if, you know, when you're entering that information, you can be mindful of that and try to, you know, select an email that you would use for both. That'd be very helpful. Um, and it's noted on there that each organization may only submit three proposals. And if it's more than three are submitted, then Aurora Institute will consider the first three that are submitted chronologically. A couple other things I just wanted to take a moment and share is about, you know, creating your profile and once you log in and use that unique email, you'll notice that there are a lot of fields uh, that are mandatory and they are highlighted and there are a lot of fields that have character limits. And I think it's helpful um, sometimes when you're filling it out, if you can see how many are left or if they're not enough, it kind of helps you edit accordingly. So I just wanted to mention that. Also, uh, at, at the end, once you've submitted you know, you've completed as much as you can and say you're not done, there's an option to save. You can save it for later, and you go back to it. You can click save and continue later. And so then you're free to go back. You'll have till May 1st at 1159 to do that. And this allows you an opportunity if you did want to collect uh, unique emails from co-presenters or any other information, and then you can, you know, have it all in there and not have to go back into it. Because once you do... Uh, submit it, save and submit, then it's in the system. And if that does happen after the fact, you're certainly welcome to email me and I'll be happy to, you know, help you adjust that. But it's great if in, the, in the beginning if you could try to, you know, look at it and, and take your time because we feel like this is extra time that's going to be helpful to everyone. Um, when you return to, once you do log out and you re return to the, say you log into your account, your submissions will be right there on the page for easy access. And so basically that's it. It's a very easy process. However, the biggest, um, the biggest, you know, suggestion and ask that I would say is just with the email. It's very helpful. And again, with the mobile app, it's the only way that um, unless folks have a unique email, they're, they're not allowed, they can't access the mobile app. They can, but it just eliminates you having to, you know, select things and switch things around. I would say that if there's anything I can do during this process or at any time, just please email me. I'm happy to help in any way I can. We really appreciate you being a part of the symposium process, and um, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Christy. Really appreciate that. And uh, I know you're all here to, to help out. Um, so I've got a quick, couple quick reminders. Um, this is, again, designing interactive session. I'm not going to read through all of these, uh, but you can, you can come back and revisit this. But, again, the, the goal here is we really want to have sessions that allow attendee interaction, uh, that really allow attendees to, um, uh, you know, interact with the speaker, interact with each other, uh, really move away from that stand and deliver type of conversation. I can just share with you, again, from years of doing the, the post-symposium surveys, um, the, the, the sessions that always get the highest amount of 
interest in ratings are are those where the attendees really, really were engaged. And so as a speaker, do make sure that you're uh, thinking about that type of design as you as you put your presentation proposal together. So we are going to open up now for um, questions. And I think, Ashley, if this works correctly, I think we're going to have the opportunity for folks to either just type in the chat box if they have questions, or they can ask questions um, uh, if they have a, have a microphone as well. Um, before I open it up for questions, then again, I would just um, remind that the RFP is now open. It opened earlier this week. Um, we do receive a large number um, each year. In the last few years, we've, we've averaged over around 800 proposals um, uh, for what typically is around 180 to 200 actual sessions. And so I share that not to be discouraging at all. We want you to submit, we want you to submit your proposals, um, but also know that uh, the, the program committee team, uh, we get awesome proposals. And it is often really, really difficult to uh, decide which ones to accept. And we know we also have to, unfortunately, sometimes wait list and reject really good ideas as well. Um, but uh, we're just thankful that we get so many great session proposals each year and really try to build out the best program we can for our for our attendees. Um, so with that, um, I'll leave this page open um, for folks that want to make sure that they follow us throughout the process. But um, you know, if you want to again type in your type in your uh, questions, or if anyone wants to come online, um, that would be fine as well. So let me. Um, just pause here for a second, and I know we've got some questions rolling in here, and I'll answer them just in a minute, or just in a second. Okay, so one of the questions I see that's been posted is, um, oh, I lost it there, excuse me just a second. What are some of the specific topics you would like to see? So as I had mentioned earlier, um, you know, we really scaled back the, the strands to about seven strands, but there's a whole host of different topics that you might want to consider um, submitting, submitting on. Um, you know, from digital content and curriculum, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, policy, advocacy, uh, things that deal with maybe helping schools or districts think about redesigning how teaching and learning takes place, um, open, open educational resources. Uh, if you have, um, you know, something for, you know, English language learners or career technical ed, um, I really, really don't want to limit you. I mean, I think if we, if we go back to, let me go back to our slide deck and find the strands that we are using this year. I mean, I think there's any number of topics that could fit into any of these, these different categories of strands here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think be, be creative and, and know that, uh, that, you know, there's lots of different topics that could fit into these particular, particular strands. Um, have presenters ever brought parents, students, or other stakeholders, and has that worked well? Uh, thanks for that question, Victoria. Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, not only has it worked well, it has worked exceptionally well. Uh, it is always a treat for our attendees to be able to interact with students and their parents. Um, our, our, every year we do a student panel keynote, which is one of the big general sessions that everybody attends. It's always a hit. And the last couple of years, we've actually had those students um, participating in additional sessions. So yeah, if, it, if it's possible that you can bring students in and or their parents as part of your presentation, that is definitely a plus. Um, we even provide complimentary registration for the K-12 students, and so that will, you know, help alleviate some of the cost of, of having them incorporated into your session. Um, but yes, 
highly encourage you to do that if you can pull it off. It's not obviously a requirement, but um, you know, <clears throat> perhaps the most important people who come to our symposiums here are, are those students because, after all, that's that's why we're all doing this work, right? So, uh, yeah, if you can bring students, that 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 would be great. Um, yeah, this slide deck will be available to you on our symposium website. We're actually going to have this entire have it have it archived, um, and then. Also, you'll be able to from our website as well. Um, sometimes it's helpful to actually see the RFP questions in advance before you just start writing away. <laughs> uh, and so you'll be able to access the RFP questions as well. So you could, uh, truthfully, you could download the RFP questions um, and then kind of craft your proposal together from there and then, then upload it uh, at, a, at a later time. So you, do, you don't have to do it all while you're sitting down in one, in one seat in front of the, in front of the, uh, um, the online submission portal. Great questions. Any other, any other questions that folks have? Right. Well, I'm not hearing any, and I don't see any more coming to the chat room. So um, let's do this. You, we are definitely available to answer any questions you may have as you're putting together your. Um, I'm going the wrong way on my slide deck. I apologize. Um, we are certainly more than willing to answer any questions that you may have. If you want to email Christy or, or myself, uh, again, there's a quick look at the timeline. So you've got some time. Um, uh, to to uh, get your proposals ready again, but but please don't be late. I, I this happens every year. I think I say this every year on this webinar as well. But um, the uh, that is a hard and fast deadline on May first. Uh, we really are not able to, to take proposals after the fact, and so please give yourself plenty of time to um, to submit your proposals. I should say too, sometimes this question comes up, is there any advantage to um, submitting your proposal early and it being accepted? Um, well, the advantage of submitting your proposal early would be that you get it off your plate, right? <laughs> so, so that you're not up against that time crunch as you're nearing May 1st. But we do not, when we do the review of all the proposals on the program committee side, um, as long as it was time, time stamped before 11:59 p.m. Excuse me, p.m. Uh, on May 1st. Um, that's what we need. We, there's no, there's no disadvantage to to waiting later to submit. There's no inherent uh, advantage to submitting early. Just make sure you get it in, get it, get it in at that time. Hey, hey, Bruce, could I piggyback for a second? I just wanted to just uh, each year. Sometimes folks will think they have uh, submitted. And just please be mindful that when you do save and submit, you should receive a confirmation email. And if you don't, please go back into the system and make sure that it was submitted. And if I can assist with that in any way, you know, please let me know. But I just wanted to remind everyone of that. Yeah, thank you for that, Kristen. That is, that is a very good reminder. Um, so when you submit, if you don't get an email confirmation from us, um, First, check your spam folder, and if it's not in there either, uh, make sure that uh, you circle back with Christy um, uh, to confirm that we received it. Alrighty, well, with that, we want to wish everyone um, uh, a great afternoon, and uh, most importantly, stay stay healthy and stay safe uh, in these interesting times that we're operating in right now. Uh, we certainly appreciate uh, you taking a, a little bit of time out of your afternoon to spend with us here. And again, if there's any questions that uh, you think about after the fact that um, you want to circle back with Christy and I on, please do not hesitate to do so. We're, we're here to help you and, and help you uh, submit the best proposals that you can. So but again, on behalf of Christy and all of my colleagues at uh, Aurora Institute, I want to thank you and uh, wish you well. Take care, everybody.